welcome to the next uh, episode about business models. Uh, so we will continue our exploration of, of various business models and how they relate to uh, to open source licensing and open source community and so on. So let's dive straight into it. Great. And now we have uh, one of the models that's grown quite a lot. I mean, I, I say recently, but I guess over the past 20 years since the IT yeah. boom. <laughs> uh, that's the internet boom, since the internet boom, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, you as a service or SaaS or, or whatever you call it. So, so basically, you make the users pay to use a piece of software. Um, mm -hmm. And this piece of software is quite commonly involves FOSS. Uh, it might just be running a, a Linux based in web browse or web server that you, people browse to. Uh, but even running like a full MongoDB or uh, MySQL or whatnot and, and letting users use that service. But quite commonly, I guess the, the, the business model in it is not to use the software. It's more like to get X, you know, um, Hosting the software costs money for whoever is providing it. Yes, I mean, the, um, of course, if it's uh, if it's some uh, some free software, then that's basically the thing. The, the thing you are making money from is that you uh, you charge more you charge more for the use of the software than your uh, than what you pay to host it. Yeah. So uh, here again, I think of uh, GitLab, where they they do. They, I think they combine a lot of those business models. But to, uh, as a software as a service, they also can host. Uh, so GitLab.com, I think, is their offering for people. So we we will host this uh, instance for you. It's the same as if you would just take our stuff and host it yourself. But we host it for you. We update it for you. Uh, we make sure everything is secure and and runs smoothly for you. And you just pay us monthly instead of hiring someone to to host it. And I mean, it's the economy of scale. Just looking at like the Fos North servers, I, I guess we use like two three percent of the CPU power. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and if you can make then fifty users use it, you you get full utilization of the computer. And then you maybe charge them half of what it would have cost to to host the computer themselves, and and yeah, profit. Maybe we can do conference sites as a service. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the controversial thing with this uh, is that it it sort of doesn't trigger distribution in 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 at least most copyleft licenses. I mean, you have the Fero GPL that does address this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but to to my knowledge, there is no lesser version of the fair GPL, so to speak. So, so it's really strong copyleft or or permissive. Yeah, uh, and it's also it's also not super adopted compared to the other uh, GPLs or the other free software licenses. Exactly. Um, so, so I mean, it, in that way, you can actually take a piece of open source software and and harden it or integrate it into your offering, and and then not share the modifications and, and sort of run it behind closed doors. Uh, and it also you could just take it, <laughs> this software which someone else also offers. So the, the people who write the software often uh, offer this as a service, but sometimes someone else is much better at, uh, at hosting it. I'm, uh, AWS comes into mind. Uh, uh, AWS versus what was it? Uh, some database. I was it MongoDB? Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think many of those. Where AWS is much much better at hosting because they are much bigger and they can do it cheaper and uh, more secure and everything. But this takes away money from from the project, which would like to take and sell it this service to be able to in reinvest back into the soft op open source code basically yeah yeah and then becomes a moral question almost so, i mean is it nobody's breaking any licenses it, it's it's completely along the rules but 
is it okay to use and sort of promote someone else's project, so to speak, or a project developed by an open source community without giving back to it? Um, and I mean, which, we, we see this. On, yeah, which to be honest, most of the companies just use other people's stuff uh, to make money, basically. Yeah, and but, that you you see that in other business models as well. So I mean, it's it's not as uh, Daniel Steinberg gets paid by every curl user just because actually, they think yeah. it's fun to give him money. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, there, there's been some controversy around this. So uh, was it MongoDB that was involved in this commons clause? I don't remember which one of them was the commons clause. The other one was this server side public license, right? So yeah, mm. I, don't and that, I mean, that's, that's another lawyer episode for us. So <laughs> t- tune in for that. But it, it's, it's definitely something that where, where FOSS licensing is being discussed, and I think there will be new licenses or adoption to licenses and so on. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, Which then is ob- obviously problematic to when you look at uh, all the, uh, what do you call them, the four... Freedoms? Freedoms, exactly. This would impact the those freedoms, uh, basically. So it's a problematic topic uh, from a moral standpoint and from a uh, license standpoint and and everything <laughs> but it yeah let's not get stuck in it but in, in in my opinion i think what's missing is like the the weak copyleft solution here so how can how can you make sure that at least the code contributions and so on are are contributed back mm. without sort of get the full strong copyleft share everything you have um but- but that's what AWS is doing. They just take exactly the code as is and they run it on their own servers. Yeah, but if, if they make improvements, currently they do not they have don't. to share it back. But they uh, don't but need it, to because it's a good product already. <laughs> yeah, and then, then that falls apart as well. Exactly. No, it's, a, it's an interesting problem, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, we, we have some, some examples. AWS is one of them, uh, obviously. Uh, and another one is like the Fediverse is, is largely run as this. So, I mean, I know that you, Gina, you run your own uh, Mastodon yes, exactly. uh, server. And my while, own Matrix while, like, servers also. <laughs> yeah, and I, I couldn't be bothered. So I, I use <laughs> technology exactly. dot, or Mastodon.technology and, and, and use someone else's hosting. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, it's... It's out there, but there there are there are moral aspects that are uh, that need to be thought about when doing this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next model. Another model is is dual licensing. So so basically having so there's a small split here on the right side in the, in the community. So, so you have a, a community of users, but you also have a few users that actually pay for getting the same product but without an open source license so so that they then can either modify it link statically to it or they might be concerned about the the license itself um i mean i i bumped into this a lot since i'm a a Qt user Mm. uh, and they use this model Um, and i mean the the fun part of it is that the best way to actually get paying customer is to have a very strong copyleft license for the open source stuff yeah so so that it's it's hard to build a closed source product around it Uh, and everybody wants to pay for getting the ability yeah but i think it's it's interesting with cute the uh, the history behind it because cute was closed completely closed source uh in the beginning and then i think even uh, richard stallman was involved into convincing the company that dual licensing would be a good way for them forward yeah they had a, a their own license that wasn't proper open source mm-hmm. in very early days mm-hmm. uh, i i don't know about the stallman involvement uh, i haven't heard of it myself but it, it it's probably the case uh but they then went to the gpl and dual licensing quite quickly uh but not quickly enough because it spawned the gnome project so mm-hmm. half of our listeners are happy that it happened <laughs> 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 um but yeah and then i mean I've, I've worked with them since they early on it was x11 
that was uh, GPL licensed, and then Mac OS 10 came, so OS X, where it was possible to run an X server. So then they opened up the the Mac version, and then finally they also opened up the the Win32 port and embedded Linux and all of that, and sort of so they gradually shifted in this direction, mm-hmm. uh, which makes me think that they actually saw that they 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 gained something business wise by by being more open. Uh, Exactly. I don't have any numbers at all, but I mean, otherwise they would have stopped. And they are still around, and uh, a lot of uh, companies like where we work and worked uh, in the automobile industry are using Qt for exactly this reason. Yeah, and I mean, they they also went through another history. So so we have a a model that we call physical products. Um, so they were owned by Nokia for a while that didn't really make money from software licenses, which meant that they actually went to a weak copyleft. Uh, And that, I think, is hampering the money stream a bit compared to having only a strong copyleft, which was the original Trolltech model. Mm -hmm. So it's it's slightly more complex than just being open. There's a, well, what is it, 26-year-old history now. But yeah, they're allowed... They're alive, live and kicking. Uh, 6.0 will come for Christmas. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I think we can. Uh, I, I saw the Stallman involvement in a, on a YouTube video where he explained to some people in the audience why this is a this was a good idea. I think we we could uh, link to it uh, later because it's it's interesting to see it from from Stallman's perspective, uh, where he says. It's better to have dual licensing than the software being only closed source or or this uh, not open source software or free software. <laughs> uh, then uh, and and uh, you you get the money and you can bring it back into the development of the uh, free software version, basically. Yeah, we should link to that talk. And we also have a talk about the other half of the puzzle here. So there's a KDE Free Qt Foundation that also guarantees that it, it, it since they use a contributions license agreement, which is another episode. So there will be lots of boxes popping up in the corner here on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> but basically, you, you allow them to relicense your code commercially. Uh, but in return, there is also a foundation saying that if they stop providing an open source version of the code within a given time frame, uh the the free uh, the KD free cute foundation or whatever it's called yeah that's another link uh can can open it up as bsd and basically make something available that both commercial and and open source can use um uh, so it's sort of and a very balanced a bit, setup so i i'm i'm not sure about the details there but there there are a lot of uh, things in cute which which are also only uh, proprietary uh, so would that also be part of this? Do you know? I think it's a set of models. Um, the, it was discussed during Academy a couple of weeks back, uh, but we also have the talk by, by Adrian de Groot. Uh, sorry for your <laughs> name, man. <laughs> completely butchered it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we can put some links in there. But it, it's kind of interesting because it's you do a CLA, they have the dual licensing, so it's both commercial and open source, and you have then sort of the the other half of of the CLA, so to speak, or the community agreement that the community can also open it. So it's it's a guarantee both ways. So it's a very interesting setup. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure there are more dual licensing examples, but we've been stuck with Qt and that's the one that comes to mind to me. I've... I've dual licensed stuff also. <laughs> I don't even remember what, but I had some uh, s- something. I didn't do it. Uh, I do a li- so there's also dual licensing in different open source licenses. So that's what I've been doing, because uh, some licenses don't allow you to 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 be pulled in into projects. So I think we've been talking about that, uh, that you cannot use a MIT license in a GPL project or something like that. And so their dual licensing was uh, was necessary, basically. Oh, okay. dual licensing between. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's not related to a business model, but still do a license. <laughs> so the, the next model is quite fun. Uh, it, it's the no model. Uh, I think it's very common to start from here. Um, everything starts from something small. Uh, th there are, I mean, you have startup based uh, open source projects as well that might not come from this route, but a lot of the, like the, the classical open source projects that, that build from, from an itch that somebody scratches for themselves come yes, from here. And, absolutely. and this basically means no model. You, you might be paid to work on it. You might not be paid to work on it. You, you might work on something completely different. Uh, but it's important not to forget this. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are no customers or no supplier customer relationship. There, there is a user development developer relationship that might be very rewarding. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is no, there are no guarantees in, in either direction. Uh, I, I really like this scratch your own itch, uh, because that's what it's about. You don't solve a problem for someone else. You write it because you want to write it. So I, I added satisfy pleasure because sometimes it's just fun to do something, even though it's not itching, but it's, th there's no real point in writing it. And the same goes for the user. They, they use it because they like it, not because they. They yeah, or, or because it satisfies some need. I mean, exactly. Even partially. you could have no model, but still be a successful and sort of uh, important project, of course. Yes. Yeah, exactly. and I guess, I mean, if you've... the Linux kernel would probably fit in here, at, at least from the very beginning. There, there is there is still no like business model around the Linux kernel. And I, I mean, suppose Linux... the new project as well. A similar thing. Yeah, you just want an OS. Exactly, <laughs> and I mean the, the the example I mentioned here because there are so many, but we referred to one of them in the uh, the degrees of openness session we did a while back, and it's the X screensaver, which is guy, written by a guy who has a nightclub somewhere in the US, and he <laughs> provides a tarball, and you can always email him if you have a problem, and. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, he doesn't want more. He thinks it's a fun project to write. And yeah, yeah. That was, that's what he does. So we've been working at Pelagico and I feel that there we we scratched a lot of features ours, uh, inside of the company where we then felt that, oh, this this will never be able to be like uh, used to get extract money from other companies. But it's useful for us in the next project so let's let's open source it and uh, so i think uh, it's one of those scratch your own itch and then suddenly other people are using it i remember jonathan writing some small uh, example uh, software which then uh, the customer took and made open source and then he saw it sometime later in some completely different uh different setting basically which was kind of fun so it may it sometimes it's just uh, has its own life later on once you open source it yeah and i mean it's just speaking from my own experience it, i mean i don't write that much code at work anymore uh, but i still like writing code so i mean this is um I, I do small games that probably not even I will play in a month's time, <laughs> but it's so fun to create them. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. So it's, uh, and opening them then just to, I mean, there's no point in keeping them closed and hopefully someone can learn from them. Um, exactly. It just makes sense. And I, I just uh, wrote a new piece of software uh, a couple of days ago because I we've been doing it uh, at work and I knew that in the new projects which i will be involved in we will need exactly the same thing and i already kind of know everything in my mind what needs to be done there so it was easy for me to just write it down in code uh, it's a different project but uh, obviously influenced by by what i've been doing at work uh, and it will help hopefully help a lot of people so basically taking all the architectural experience exactly, and yeah. sort of, you, you know, where the rough corners are. Exactly. But I, I think it's very important to remember this no model, uh, when discussing other business models, that this is, uh, 
I have no no measurement, but I, I would imagine that a majority of the software at least started as this. They might be packaged by someone else, but it's probably written without a business model around it from the start. Uh, the majority of open source projects, you mean? Yeah, and I'm, oh, I happen to I sit in front of a <laughs> Linux machine, so yeah. the software on this one. But yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think a lot, most of the uh, applications for Windows, I don't think they started like that. Uh, no, no, of course. Yeah, no, you're right. So that's the last of the the business model episodes. So thank you for listening. Um, as always, we're on fos northse slash pod for for the pod listeners or in your favorite pod player. We're also on conf.tube, which is a peer tube instance, and on YouTube. So if you're on, on one of those, we appreciate your, your likes and subscribes and comments. Uh, for the pod listeners, you can always reach us via mail that you find on the homepage. See ya. See ya. <laughs>